to say good evening to all of you there to listen to the podcast. This is another Big K's Corner, and we are glad to have you with us. As always, we want to encourage you to grab a pencil and a piece of paper. We're going to be studying this week and next week some things about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And a lot of people take into consideration that that's the storyline of the person of the Lord Jesus Some people use that word gospel speaking of the entirety of the Word of God, but we will be focusing especially on what the gospel is in the New Testament. And we also want you to take time, if you would, to shoot a text or a phone call, let someone know that we are on the air and that the Higher Grounds podcast is beaming once again loud and clear, another big case corner. And I do thank the pastor and the church family for this opportunity, as well as all of you. Now, I want to say this before we get started. We have received some uh, more communication from folks in that have listened to the broadcast, and uh, we've even had some question and answer times with some people, and we have want, uh, wanted to say for a week or two now how much that we do appreciate your interest in the Word of God and your interest in the Higher Grounds podcast ministry. I want you to know that we take it very seriously to come prepared and to try to be a blessing to you that are saved and to be a light unto the lost each and every week. So with that, I want to again say thank you kindly for your words of encouragement and for all the good comments that have come in. I appreciate that very much. All right, here we go. We're going to be in the book of Romans chapter number one. We're going to look at some other verses uh, maybe this week, maybe next. It just depends on time. But we're studying on the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I have I have broken it down into two parts. So if time allows, we'll deal with it for two weeks. If not, then we will complete it on the third. But nonetheless, our focus is a gospel of which I am not ashamed or a gospel that I am not ashamed of. That's Gram- uh, grammatically speaking, we're not supposed to end a sentence or a t- title with a preposition, but nonetheless, you understand my drift and where we're coming from. Now, we have a lot of apologies going around today, a lot of apologies that I fully believe in my heart are um, just ludicrous and undeserving and unnecessary, and we've apologized for being everything but a human. And I want you to know, regardless of what the world says or does, that the Christian does not ever have to be ashamed of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said that if we were ashamed of him in this present and wicked generation, that he would be ashamed of us in the presence of the Father and the holy angels. And so when that great and faithful day comes and the Lord returns to take his children home and he takes his church off of this earth and home to be with him forever, I do not want to meet the Lord with shame anywhere on my track. I just don't want that. I don't want to have a testimony of being ashamed of him, and I certainly don't want to see him stand before the Father and have any reason to be ashamed of me. The old timers used to say, when he comes, I want him to see that I'm flying my colors clear. In other words, I don't want to change what I am just because it may be politically incorrect or it may be offensive to some other faith or organization that's uh, out there in in a, in the world today, and so the the gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is not meant to make one arrogant, nor is it meant to be a tool of offensiveness in any way. Some people, some people love to argue. Some people love to argue so much so that they are known for their bitterness, and uh, it's it's not a good testimony. However, on the flip side of that, some people refuse to stand up for their faith. Now, I believe there's a balance. I don't believe in casting our pearl before the swine. I don't believe in being uh, tore down in foolish uh, questions of science, as Paul warned us of, or of any gendering of strife that's going to allow us to just to create more questions than we started out with. In most cases, in most cases, When the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is come into question, it is for two reasons. One of them is 
The person wants a better or a clearer understanding. When you're dealing with someone that is lost and you're the only tool that God gave us to win souls with is the gospel of Christ, then we ought to have our our ground, uh, so to speak, uh, settled on exactly how we're going to introduce them to the gospel. How, what, what, uh, what epistle? What are we going to use? What scripture? What gospel? What story? What parable? We should have something ready to start the conversation. But if that person injects a question and they are sincere about it, we need to be well groomed in the scripture. And there's no better way to do that. Than than by studying and reading the Word of God thoroughly. We'll mention that in just a few minutes. Secondly, some people want to ask questions about the gospel for the sole purpose of trying to trip the witness or the believer up in their faith. And for example, for example, sometimes when you get into a, a discussion about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, they will, they will throw things that are very popular in questions, or they will throw things out that they simply find um, ludicrous in their understanding. It may be by impulse, it may be by something you say, or it may just be something that they ask every single person that ever invites them to church or talks to them about the Lord. Some people have their ready-made confrontation before you ever get started. Now, there is a right way and a wrong way to respond to that. We don't want to cower down in shame. I'm going to show you that. I'm going to be very clear about what it means to be bold in Christ. Christ and what it means to be boastful in self. We're going to show you that over the next two weeks. But here's what I want you to understand. Not to answer is wrong in several ways. More importantly, the, the most significant is if you cannot answer. Uh, that is wrong. You should never, you, you may have to get back to that person, but you should never be, you should never allow anyone to trip you up in something like, well, I just don't believe in the virgin birth. That's part of the gospel. Well, you may not believe in it, but I've got scripture and I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Now, beloved, if they reject the word, there's nothing we can do. But if they reject us, and it's because of of our lack of study and our lack of preparation, and we've just maybe in maybe in fear or intimidation been talked down, beloved. That's not good because what happens is is uh, the next time that that person and you ever have an inquiry or a conversation about the gospel, they are going to consider themselves one up. And what I mean by that is they're going to try to control the conversation and try to derail you every time. I've seen it over and over, especially with people that you are with every day, on the job, or loved ones that you see almost every week of your life. Uh, over a period of time, it becomes customary. Now, let's, let's answer the question, why do we have a gospel to begin with? In Romans chapter 1, in verse number 14, here's what the Apostle Paul said. He said, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. The reason that we have a gospel is because we are indebted to this world. You say, preacher, what do you mean? Well, us being saved, us that have been saved, the body of Christ, the believer, the New Testament church, the bride of the Lord Jesus, we that have been re reconciled back to God, we are forever indebted to share that gospel story to everyone. That verse being uh, both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, the wise and unwise, that's, an, that's just a, a, an all-inclusive phrase. In other words, there is no one in whom God does not want to save. So, uh, Peter said that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come into repentance. Jesus said that I have come uh, to, save, uh, to seek and to save that which is lost. Every single person that is not saved is lost. That means he is seeking to save every single person. Does everybody go to heaven? No. Can everybody go to heaven? Yes. We'll share that more about that in just a while. In verse number 15, he said, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel, not a gospel, not just one particular portion.
portion of the gospel, but the entirety of the gospel. I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Now, why is that? Verse 16 answers the question. Why is Paul ready to preach? Because, he says, for, and this is my reason, this, that's a, that phrase or that, uh, that word for means this is explaining why I'm ready. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God. Therein, where is the righteousness of God? In the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to say much about that, all right? He said, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith that is written, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I quote from Habakkuk 4.4. 4. Now, let me share some things with you as we lay a foundation. Let me first introduce you to the preacher of the gospel. In verse number 16, the Bible said, for I, Paul doing the writing to the, to the church at Rome, as he is addressing them, says, for I am ready. I am ready. Well, let's look in verse number one at what made the apostle Paul ready. The Bible says in, in verse one of chapter one of Romans, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God. The preacher of the gospel. Well, the apostle Paul, known throughout probably every every facet of religion in some form or fashion, regardless of the denomination or whatever. And I excluding the, the, the cults, I'm talking about within the affiliation of Christianity, just about everybody has some kind of idea of who the apostle Paul was. Might I say that he wrote more of the word of God than any in the New Testament. That being said, let's consider some things about him. He was a converted man. A and the Bible gives his testimony in the book of Acts, chapter number 9. And uh, we know that the Apostle Paul was headed to arrest those that were promoting the gospel, especially the resurrection. That was the part of the gospel that everyone was being slaughtered for, arrested for, ridiculed for, and imprisoned for, was those that preached the resurrection of Christ. The world don't mind a dead Christ on a cross. They don't mind a little baby in the manger at, at the Christmas time. But what they do not want is a resurrected God of their never dying soul. They do not want to recognize his deity and his authority, his kingship, nor anything else, in, collectively speaking, uh, in the world today. They do not want an authoritative Christ. They want a Christ that was weak and a Christ that was slain. They don't want to recognize the Christ of the gospel. Well, if you take any portion of the gospel out, we'll show you that in just a minute. If you take any portion of the gospel out, you have forfeited the gospel. There, there cannot be a partial. It is, it, it, it is either entire or it is incomplete. It is either all true or none true. We'll show you that, okay? Now, secondly, about the preacher of the gospel, he was changed. He went from arresting and killing those that were preaching the gospel of Christ to being a preacher of the gospel himself. And thirdly, verse number one said that he was called. He was called. That is, he was separated unto the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was called to be an apostle and separated unto the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel of God. Now, <clears throat> very carefully, Carefully, let me give you five main factors that uh, are part of the gospel that I understand you, you think in death, burial, and resurrection, but there's more to the story, all right? Listen carefully. There's more to the gospel story. The gospel begins with the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus. Now, here's what that means. He was virgin conceived, and he was virgin born. Anyone that takes away the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, if they denounce it, they reject it, they ridicule it, they say that it's not true or anything, 
anything else, then they have destroyed the gospel by its very definition. Now, we don't have to be able to explain everything about the virgin birth, for it was a miracle in and of itself. But under no circumstance did God ever incorporate Mary to be part of the Godhead, neither did he incorporate a physical relation with Mary for the Lord Jesus to be born. He was virgin born. He was virgin conceived. Secondly, there was his sinless life. I'll share that with you in just a moment. His sinless life upon the earth. Thirdly, there was the death on the cross, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. He did not die on a stake. He did not die on a pole. He did not die from the beatings. He did not die of a gunshot wound, nor did he die from the spear that was thrust in his side on the cross. He died from the crucifixion and he yielded up the ghost. He had the power, the Bible says, to lay his life down. He had the power to take it up again. So there is the virgin birth. There is the sinless life. There is the death of, on the cross. But uh, fourthly, there was the burial. He was buried. It is very important that we note that he did not go into a coma. He did not go to sleep. He did not pass out. He died. His physical body died. The third day, and fifthly, this gospel includes the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Now, I'm not going to belabor all of the factors in the proof text. I'm just going to leave that there with you as, as so that you can see the five points of the gospel that must be defended of which... I, I might add, we do not have any reason to be ashamed of. The virgin birth, the sinless life, the death on the cross, the burial, and the resurrection on the third day. That constitutes what we consider and call the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So there's the preacher of the gospel that had nothing to do with what I just shared at one point in his life, but after he met Christ, after Christ became his Savior, he not only rejoiced in the gospel, he became a preacher, a proclaimer of the gospel. Let me mention secondly now the person of the gospel. The Bible said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The person of the gospel is the Lord Jesus. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree. Paul said to the church at Corinth that I have delivered unto you that which I have also received, that Christ Jesus was, he was crucified and buried and rose again. Can I say this? You might, you might uh, come to a point of, of hesitation. I personally do not. And that is this. I believe that there is absolutely a must in understanding and believing and proclaiming along with this gospel that he, he was born, that he lived sinless, that he died, that he rose again, that he is returning. He is coming again. The same Bible that said he was going to be born was fulfilled in his birth. The same Bible that said that he would make his, his, his burial among the thieves, among the sinners. It was fulfilled when he was buried in the borrowed tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Are you listening now? I believe with all of my heart that the Bible will be fulfilled in his return. There's nothing that's going to delay it. There's nothing that's going to keep it from happening. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ allows us to note that by his uh, the authority of his resurrection we are not we are not saved beloved because Jesus was born and died we are saved beloved because Jesus died and he rose amen had he not risen from the grave then we would have a partial gospel we would have a defeated savior we would have a gospel that could not save but because he did rise from the from the grave we do know 
know that he is the justifier of those that come unto him. Now we're going to share something with you uh, uh, in the in the in the days ahead. But I want to set up a foundation right here and uh, let you understand some things. Uh, this gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is very precious to God the Father. It is very precious indeed. So much so that God put a particular warning. Uh, if I could use that word, uh, on those that would make, make fun of the gospel, deny the gospel, denounce the gospel, those that would mock it, uh, those that scoff at it, uh, there's a, there's a, there is an expectancy in our in our country today, in our land. I guess it's worldwide, but I only live in America, so I can only speak for what I see going on in, in our land, in our communities today. But there is an expectancy for, for the believer in Christ to be muffled, for them to tone it down. Uh, everyone else can rant and rave and hoot and holler, but the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is expected to take a back seat. Uh, 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 in other words, <clears throat> to hold our heads down in silence. Could I say to you, I'm not going to do that. And beloved, if you've been saved by the grace of God, you should not do that. I don't believe that we should constitute a rise uh, up in arms and, and take our, our ball bats to the ball field and and uh, use them for clubs to those uh, against those that don't agree with us. But beloved, I by no means am going to hang my head in shame. I, I, I don't believe that that is the, the, the will of God in any wise. Now, for those that hate the gospel and those that are against the gospel and those that want to stamp out the gospel message, here's what the Bible said in the book of Galatians and chapter number one. The Bible said in verse eight, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. What did he preach? The death, burial, the resurrection, his conception, his conquest, his, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. He said, though, though, though any man, I don't care if it's an angel, that, now there's a group that, that says an angel brought another gospel. Could I tell you, uh, this Bible warns against that. You better hear this preacher. If we preach any other other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. Verse number nine. Uh, he said, as we have said before, so say I now again. In other words, we would use the phraseology, in case you didn't get that, let me say it one more time. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now, <clears throat> in the in, 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 the, in the original phraseology, there were two words that made up that, that statement, let him be accursed. And that was anathema maranatha. Uh, regardless of how you consider the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, here's a boundary that God put up. God established a boundary around this gospel. And here's what he said. Anathema, let him be accursed. Let him be cut off from God without hope. If any man preaches any other gospel than the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, God said, let that man be cut off. He is cut off from God without hope. Maranatha means for the Lord is coming. Time is short. We don't have time to debate. We don't have time to argue. Not only do we not have any time to argue or debate over the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't have any interest to. I am willing and ready and desirous to share the gospel with anybody that is willing to listen. Anybody that needs the Lord Jesus as their Savior. There's not a mile won't drive. There's not an hour that I won't expire and tire my body. If it took a week every day and, and, the, and there was genuine conviction and a person was desirous to know more about the Lord, it's my joy 
joy. It's my privilege. It's my desire to share the gospel to them. But could I say to you, could I say to you today, if all they want to do is, is play uh, tiddly winks and make mockery of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm not expiring myself for that. I'm not going to extend myself. Listen, uh, the, the, Lord, the Lord Jesus died for the whole entire world. He died for the very ones that nailed him to the tree. He prayed for the very ones that crucified him and ridiculed him and, and made all sorts of railing accusations and mockery and blasphemy of, of him as he hanged dying on the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them. There is no more compassion ever demonstrated than, than what Jesus demonstrated that day on Calvary. He stopped dying long enough to save a thief that hung beside of him. Can I say to you that we should have that same love. We should have that same admonishment and desire in our heart. One of the reasons, one of the reasons sinners are not being saved today is that the believer has lost so much intimacy with God and there's so much lack of prayer time. There's no impregnation of souls anymore in the heart of the believer. Uh, the, the reason reason Zion cannot travail is because Zion has not been impregnated with souls. We need to get back to that. But at the same time, could I say to you, under no, under no circumstances whatsoever does God ever intend uh, to muzzle the believer and shut the believer down from expressing their faith and sharing their testimony and sharing the witness of the Lord Jesus Christ at any and every opportunity that it could uh, that could be afforded to them. Now, again, let me say this as we uh, bring this week to a close. I don't believe in being arrogant. I don't believe in being rude. I do not. I do not believe in any way whatsoever should the believer ever seek to offend anyone. But I want you to understand, beloved, today, you hear this preacher and you hear me well, that we have have come to a time in our Christianity that we are going to have to stand up for what we believe in. And I'm not talking about uh, uh, being being boisterous or trying to make the six o'clock news or, or going around and creating a hoobla. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is I know in whom I have believed. I am not ashamed of being a born again believer. I am not ashamed of being a born again believer that is of the Baptist faith. I am not ashamed of this King James Bible. I am not ashamed of my call to preach the blessed word of God. And I refuse. I refuse. I've done fought too many battles. I've done lost too many friends. I've done paid enough dues in this life. I refuse at this age in my life as I see the coming of the Lord and I see the age of my body and the ex inspiration of my life. I refuse, beloved, to bow my head in shame. I know in whom I have believed. I'm still a King James Bible believing, born again believer that is part of the local Baptist church. Until next time.